Francesc, welcome. Comes, stays in Barcelona. He comes from Barcelona, stays in San Francisco, works, has been working in Google for the last five years, and is a core Go contributor. Among uh, his passions is to make Go very easy for us and help the community out. And among his quirks, our man cycles, bicycles from San Francisco to LA every year, celebrated his 30th birthday cycling 600 miles wearing a big red frock. And he boasts of being able to speak five languages with his foreign accent. Right? So, Francesc, welcome. Stage is yours. You. Hi, everybody. So, uh, today I'm going to be talking about the evolution of a gopher. If you've read the program, you will realize that I changed the title. And I changed it yesterday, but that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit more about me, and then I will stop talking about me. Don't worry. So, uh, I'm a developer advocate for the Google Club platform now, uh, but I joined the Go team in 2012 as a developer prompt engineer, which is pretty much the same thing, actually. Uh, and I'm a lover of programming languages, all of them. I do have a little bit of a preference for one of those, but I'm not going to say which one it is. <laughs> And most of my work is involved being pretty much a teacher. Uh, I'm a teacher internally at Google, so I manage uh, internal trainings, uh, workshops, code labs, and so on, but also externally. And what I do externally, I prepare talks like this one, even though I'm not really sure you're going to learn much about Go today. <laughs> it's not the point of the talk. Uh, but also I create uh, workshops. I've worked on the Go tour, if you ever go went through it. Uh, I'm one of the persons that works with that, and so on. And I'm on Twitter, uh, Francesc, so if you ha want to ha ask any questions afterwards, that's the easiest place. And I'm on GitHub, so you can find a bunch of code and file issues if you want to. Cool, so, uh, they look good. <laughs> so, uh, this talk is going to be about these guys here. Uh, those are gophers. Uh, there's five of them here. And uh, the talk is, Vaguely inspired by a talk by Raquel Velez uh, at JSConf, I think it was, uh, that it's named The Evolution of a Developer. That goes through the evolution of a developer from discovering a language, in this case with JavaScript and Node.js, to uh, becoming kind of like a master of JavaScript. And what I'm going to be doing today is going through all of those steps. And so there's an extra gopher there. <laughs> that I want to talk about too. Uh, and I, I really want to thank Satish, and uh, I'm going to say his name wrong, but go Tao. There you go. <laughs> and NAJ for the organization. Uh, thank you so much for having me here and giving me the opportunity to stand up in front of all of you right now. This is awesome. I'm looking forward for the food too. So the phase of evolution after talking with uh, multiple golfers and people that uh, either were learning Go or that they had discovered Go a long time ago, or that they had created Go, uh, I decided to, that I, I identified four different phases. The first one is the newcomer. And the newcomer is someone that has been written, has written like maybe some lines of Go code, most of them on the Go playground or the Go tour, and probably Go is not even installed on their machines yet. But they're trying to get used to the syntax and learning uh, this, uh, how you write a function, it's func not function, these kind of things, just getting used to the syntax, learning how to do, use slices and, uh, and arrays and maps and so on, and then defining some types and methods, but nothing really complicated there. How many of you consider yourself as newcomers to the language? Like you haven't really much go at all. Cool, oh wow, okay, really? He's organizing a Go conference? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> why not? <laughs> Thank you for organizing it still. So the second, the second phase is the explorer. And the explorer is someone that really knows the language a little bit. He's able to write a, a, whole, a, whole, pro, a whole program without having to check it out. And how do I write a for loop or these kind of things? You already know the syntax. There's things that you still don't know that you're still discovering, like how do I actually use channels? and uh, 
What is that data race again? These kind of things you're going to be discovering a little bit later. You haven't written any big project yet, though. Uh, how many of you consider yourselves explorers? OK. There's people that consider themselves multiple things. That's good. <laughs> the, third, the third phase that I'm going to be talking about is the builder. And builders, I think they're really important because a builder is basically someone that, for them, Go is a tool. That's it. It's a tool. It's a means to solve a problem. And they have big projects or big-ish projects that they work on regularly. And they're trying to solve a problem with Go. And it turns out that Go is the best suited tool for them. But that's it. They know Go enough. Go is not a problem anymore. They're trying to solve a problem, not learn more Go. How many of you consider yourselves as builders? Cool. Not that many anymore. <laughs> and finally, it's just the gopher expert. And the gopher expert is someone that not only understands the programming language itself, not only understands Go, but also is able to understand What's, this, what's the philosophy behind it? Why do we have short variable names? Uh, why uh, there's no inheritance? Why there's so th all of these things? There are different features of a language that could either be there or not be there, and they're able to understand what's the point of them uh, being or not being there, and what's the impact of those in the way you write code. So this is pretty much at the highest level of gophers ever, and. You could tell there's a fifth level, create like basically like Rob Pike and Ken Thompson and Robert Prismer and other members of the Go team. And uh, actually, I'm not going to ask. So I'm not going to talk about those because I didn't interview them. So I don't want to talk about that. But uh, I'm not going to ask either who of you in here are experts, just because I know that the uh, imposter syndrome is a real thing. And that most of you that are considered experts won't raise your hands. So whatever, I'm not going to even ask you. OK, so the rest of the talk is going to be basically a guide of, OK, so if you're in this phase, how do you get to the next one? And if you're not in that phase, you're already in one of the higher phases. This is still pretty interesting information because it's going to help you, your coworkers or friends, becoming better gophers. So the first one is the baby gopher, which I think it's the cutest one. And uh, this is the, the newcomer gopher. So the newcomer gopher is the one that has gone through some tutorials or workshops and understands the basic concepts of the language. But that's pretty much it. So uh, you should be able to understand the syntax and uh, what is a slice, how do you use it, what's a map. And then, as I said before, uh, you should be able to define new functions and types and methods. You may not understand how interfaces work yet, and that's totally cool. Or you may not be able to understand how to use concurrency correctly, and that's totally normal. And most of the time, what you do is you create small programs. Uh, most of the time, they actually even compile. <laughs> and also toy projects. And a toy project for me is something that you write once, and you don't really reuse at all. It's something just to try out the language itself. And at this stage, something that the, the things that are the most useful for uh, newcomers are the Go tour, the Go playground, the documentation, and you should read documentation. It's actually really useful. And uh, all the different communities that are out there. So Golang Nuts is the mailing list. And here you can ask any questions, uh, even mo the most basic ones. And people will be nice to you and answer, probably with a link to a I freaking ask questions, but that's still nice. Uh, you also have Slack, Slack and ERC that I personally use. There's something that happens at this point, which is you start trying to learn new things because at some point you, you actually understand the syntax and so on, and you try to write something. And most of the time, you will find problems. You will have new questions you don't know how to answer. And at this point is when you, have, you learn something that is the most important thing to learn at this step, which is how to ask questions. And how to ask questions sounds like it's easy, but it's actually pretty hard to ask a good question. And basically, you will see very often on, on Golang Nuts, people sending a, a, an email saying, hey, this doesn't work, and that's it. And this is actually not really that useful, because if you ask a question like that, 
people are going to be like, oh, well, so could you please give me some code that I can read or something so I can have some context? And then you might copy paste like 500 lines of code and put them in an email and send that. And people are going to be very nice to you and they will ask you, hey, could you just use the playground for that? And if you don't know that, the playground has a button that says share. There's the best way to share code, the uh, Go code. You can then run it and modify it and play with it. So really use it. If you, are, if you have questions about the language at this early stage, the most important thing is be careful on how you ask questions. Put all the context that you can. Context, the logs, the code, everything that you can give, the better. So as you are asking questions and getting answers, you keep on learning new things. And at some point, you reach this stage. This stage is the, the builder. And a builder is someone that has already written some small projects. And you still get lost pretty often. And actually, at this stage, it's totally normal and good to get lost because it means that you're learning new things. And the good thing is that you keep on getting lost, but you're really pretty good at finding the answers. So you're really good at ask, asking questions and uh, finding the documentation that you, that you care about and these kind of things. And at this point, something pretty interesting happens, which is, and this is the power of the talk that I'm not really sure people are going to like, but this is a completely non-scientific graph, OK? <laughs> There's uh, the, the axe on the bottom is the experience, and the units of experience is days or weeks, no matter what. I don't re it's just some time of experience. And then on the left side, we have happiness which you can count on smiley faces. So, we, so far, we saw the newcomer phase. The newcomer phase is the one on the left to the first vertical line. So it's basically you're learning new stuff, and you're super excited, and you keep on learning new things. And then you realize that you're able to, to learn so many new things. You have, you have the access to so much documentation and, and tutorials around. You can ask questions. And then all of a sudden, you realize that you're Superman, and you're super powerful, and you can basically do everything with Go. And at this stage, the problem is that you're going to have like, expectations that are huge about the language. And when you have huge expectations, well, you end up being kind of disappointed. So let's talk about that. One second. Oh. OK. so. This is what, uh, for the hype of new, te new technologies, it's the concept that it's normally used. It's the peak of inflated expectations. And basically, you're like, oh, Go is so awesome. I can do everything. And then you try to do everything in it. And what happens normally at this point is that, you know, I really love that framework from this language that I used to, do, used to use. I want to migrate it. I, I'm sure can, I, can, I sure can do it. So you start doing these kind of things. And the problem is that at this point, you're basically trying to improve the ecosystem of Go frameworks and features without really understanding it. And I'm not saying that there's no space for improvement. There's definitely, there's definitely is. But at this point, maybe you're going to be a little bit trying to achieve more than you can. And you're going to end up having a series of problems. And yeah, as I said, when you have inflated expectations, bad things happen. So there's the second part of that graph, which is when it goes down, which is the trough of this, this uh, that word is super hard to pronounce, disillusionment, or something like that. <laughs> I have an accent, yes. Uh, so basically, you're thinking, it was like, hey, but I really miss this feature or this, uh, this um, framework for another language. And you end up having, so, you end up creating new frameworks and so on. And very often, what it happens is that you create frameworks that are inspired by something from a different language. And different languages are not only different languages, are also different communities and different philosophies. Which means that at the end of the day, when you're going to create this, you're going to create something that probably works, but it's not idiomatic. And idiomatic is basically what a gopher expert could expect to read from your code. That's pretty vague definition. But basically, it's what, I, like, what, what you expect to read as normal Go code. 
There's something that happens pretty often. Uh, one of the symptoms is that you're going to start using the reflect package and then save package very often. And those are packages that allow you to do reflection. So you're going to be able to do really fancy things with it. But the problem is that most of the time, you're doing really fancy things in Go. Uh, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. In Go, we try to keep it really simple and do things that are really easy to understand. And one example about this is I. I asked uh, Jeremy Science first before, before telling you about this, but he wrote this, uh, this framework called Martini, which was a porting from the Sinatra framework, Sinatra RAM framework from Ruby, and he migrated to Go. And it was magic. It made so many cool things. It actually even supported dependency injection, which I thought that was amazing. But the problem is that when you do this, you end up having code that looks like Ruby. And even though the community accepted it at the beginning really, uh, really well, actually, early enough, people started complaining about the fact that it was slow. I mean, slow compared to Go. If, if you're used to Ruby, it could be slightly faster. But if you're Gopher, you could be, this is really slow. And also, the errors were hard to understand and so many things just because the code base behind it was pretty complex. And uh, Jeremy uh, wrote a blog post basically saying, yeah, I know. So basically saying, yeah, I accept your critics, and you're totally right. And I f there, there you go. I fixed it. And he delivered a new version, which is a sim sim uh, like, uh, simple version of Martini. It's called Negroni. That has the basic things, but not so much reflection. Actually, I think that there's no reflection at all. So yeah, if, you, if you're at this point, and you really feel like you're missing some things of the language, uh, my, my advice is uh, try to use the language as it is for now. And if you think that the standard library is not powerful enough to do what you want to do, you might be wrong. The standard library is really powerful. And when you really understand all the things you can do with it, you could be really surprised. My first uh, big uh, change list or uh, pull request or whatever you want to call it, depending on your culture, uh, that I wrote was something internal at Google. And it was around 300 lines of Go code. And then I had my, uh, my first code review. That was Andrew Duran. And my 300 lines of code became 100. Just because, like, yeah, there's this thing called the standard library that you should use. So really, like, just go through the standard library, try to learn more about it. And I think that this is the most important part about this, this, this phase, is you're going to feel some pain just because you're missing things. That's normal. Just keep on just accepting the languages at least for now. And if you have feedback, though, feel free to, to, to give it around. So if you don't believe me and you're like, oh, no, I cannot do this. I cannot do this anymore. Uh, I'm going to give you some ideas about how to avoid the pain. You know, it's like if you don't look at the hand that you get smashed, it doesn't hurt that much anymore. So pretty much the same idea of, yeah, we know there's some things in the language that you might not like yet. Let's try to do something else. And there's two new things that I got really excited about. One is Go Generate, and the other one is Go on Android. The first thing, Go Generate, is actually really simple. Is, uh, I wrote this thing, JSON enums. So Go Generate, what it does is, when you, it's, a, it's an extra step on your build process for authors. So before you do Go Build or Go Install, you do Go Generate, and that's going to generate some Go code. So you can use it with Flex and Yak and so on to generate code that your project afterwards is going to use. And I had this, uh, this project that I was writing where I had uh, integer types and a bunch of constants, which is the way you implement enums in Go. And it turns out that if you use that in JSON, you're going to end up putting just integer values rather than strings. And you can just write this by hand, and it's really boring. Or you can have a lot of fun and write a little package like this one. So JSON in ARMS is it's, it's on GitHub, by the way. And it's around, I think it's like 200 lines of code. And what it does is it uses the AST package in the standard library, and it parses Go. And basically what it does, it, it goes through, so through this code. So in this code, I'm defining a type pill that has uh, one, two, three, four, five different values. So placebo, aspirin, ibuprofen, paracetamol, and acetaminophen. And what it does, it generates a JSON Marshall method for that. So it generates this code here. So 
The code here is pretty boring, and the code on top is even more boring. The code on top is just a map saying, if you receive the value placebo, I want you to return the string placebo. If you receive the aspirin, I want you to return the string aspirin, and so on. So this is actually pretty boring code. The good thing is that now, just because I add this go generate comment there, when I do go generate, all of this code is automatically generated, and I just forget about it. So this is pretty nice, and it, it allowed me to start using the AST package and the type check package and so on. It's very interesting. It's a good way of getting to write more code and trying to advance on trying to become a, a better gopher. Then this really cool thing. So this uh, a little prompt that I wrote, like maybe 300 lines of code, and what it does, it gets an image, so the gopher head, and it does this really cool thing, so it's like a image with water style, something like that. And this is all written in Go. This is all written in Go using OpenGL. And this is supposed to run on Android, but you don't need to run it on Android, which is a cool thing. I don't want to run it on Android. I just wanted to play with OpenGL. I really like graphics. And this is a really good way also to, to start playing with more things. Like, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the next, well, whenever I have time, <laughs> I'm thinking about writing a, a, an actual game. So you have everything you need to write a game. And then you can even install it on, on your phone and start playing with it. So this could be also a good experience of trying to write more code and forgetting a little bit about all the features that you're lacking. There's also an extra step, an extra thing that you can do at this point, which is uh, participate in challenges. Uh, I've heard about two of them. One of them is the Gopher Gala. And the logo looks really creepy here. <laughs> it's supposed to look cute. And uh, the Gopher Gala is a global hackathon. It took place in January. And uh, basically, it was global hackathon. Anyone can participate. And there was uh, people demonstrating what they could be able to do in just one weekend in Go. Uh, one, of the, one of the, so there was, I think, 128, uh, 128 submissions. And they were all really good. But one of my favorites was Go Report Card. So basically what it does is you, you write your, uh, your repo URL, and it will tell you everything that you're doing wrong. <laughs> so it will check, uh, is the format good? Is the naming good? Is, there's a lot of different things that you can do with code, par uh, code parsing and code analysis. And uh, you can have a lot of fun basically trying to find who has the worst repo in your team. Uh, <laughs> When you're working in the Go team, it's not a good idea. It's, it's not really a good idea. You're going to lose. And the second one is Golang, uh, the Go Challenge. And the Go Challenge is organized by your friend here, Satish. And what it, this is about, it's going to be every single month, a uh, Gopher expert, an uh, expert from the community, will submit a challenge. And you're going to have, uh, I think it's two weeks to solve it. And at the end of that, there's going to be some, uh, some uh, jury and uh, at the end of the day, the person that submitted the challenge will choose who's the winner. And there's going to be prizes and so on, but I don't really care about those. I just care about the fact that the challenges are going to be really cool. The first one is created by Matt Amonetti, I think. And he works doing pretty much like GitHub for music edition. It's called Splice. And he's going to do something related to that, I think. And I think it's going to be awesome. So if you want to play with Go and try to learn new things, this is probably a good idea. It's every month. It died again. <laughs> cool. So now we get to the third stage. So we've seen, we've seen the newcomer. We've seen the explorer. And once you start doing so many things and challenges and you start doing this small project, at some point, you decide that Go is probably the good solution to solve an actual problem that you have. And so the builder is someone that solves problems. And for them, Go, it's just a tool. Now, it's a tool that they want to master, of course, because when you master a tool, you will solve your problems faster. But the good thing about solving an actual problem is that there's going to be, when you solve a real problem, the, the level of detail that you have to go inside is going to be pretty big, which means that you're going to have to solve new problems. And you have, you're going to have to answer new questions. And to answer those questions, you're going to have to find solutions. And those, so you're going to learn e either from uh, discovering new solutions to your questions, 
or by failing at, a, at that. And at this point, I think that failing at finding solution is really good because this is going to give you experience about what works and what doesn't. So you're going to keep on writing more and more code, and you're going to keep on learning a lot. But the interesting thing is that now your goal is not to learn. Your goal is just to master this tool that you're using to solve problems. So to do this, sometimes you find a good, a good project that you want to do by yourself. Like you have an idea of like, hey, I, don't, I want to work in this, and I'm going to solve this problem. So if you have that, that's awesome. But if you don't, then there's some existing projects that you could contribute. The first one is Go. And it uh, turns out that Go is not only open source, but it's also on GitHub now. So, so uh, uh, contributing is even easier. So uh, and what's the, what better way to learn Go than making Go a better language? So I could definitely encourage you to try, once you really understand Go and how it works, if you want to learn more, the, uh, contributing is probably a very good idea. Then there's also Docker and Kubernetes. Uh, those are really big projects too, Green and Go. Docker is one of the most wildly successful uh, projects that I've heard lately. And they also accept uh, open source contributions. So it's going uh, to be good. Uh, there's also a list of many other projects that you could use. Uh, it's a very long list that I'm sure it's not exhaustive because uh, new projects pop up every day pretty much. So, but it's going to be a good place to start. OK, so when you're a builder, uh, there's new things that you care about that you didn't really care that much before, which one of them is tooling. And turns out that Go has really good tools. So it's something that I think that you're going to start really appreciating when you get to this stage. You might have used already Go get and build, install and run and so on, and we've seen Go generate. But there's, the, there's all the tools that at this stage you're going to start using at all, and I could even say, if you're not using them, you're not doing it right. So the first one is GoVet. Uh, how many of you have heard about GoVet? OK, it's not that many. So GoVet is a tool that allows you to find errors uh, in your code that the compiler won't check. So one typical example is if you have a printf call and the arguments in the format string, uh, there's, not, there's more arguments in the format string than the, the ones you're passing or the other way around. That kind of thing, the Go compiler won't check it, but GoVet will. So you're going to find small errors in your program. So you should always use it. Then there's Go test. And if you've, cre if you've written any test ever, uh, you will have to use this. But there's also Go test dash race. And this is awesome, <laughs> really, really awesome. And you should use it. Uh, basically, it's going to find data races in your code. And if you think that you don't have data races in your code and you're not using this, I won't really believe you. Like, really, you should always have this activated in your tests. As, as soon as you start using more than one Go routine, data races could happen. And it happens to the best. Like, uh, there were bugs in the standard library that were discovered when we added Go test that race. So really, even though you think that you might not have that issue, this is really useful. There's also a go build dash raise, I think, that will generate a binary that you can run and that still keeps checking your, uh, your data races. So you could have, you have like 50 servers in production, and you could have one extra that runs way slower, but will be able to shadow traffic and check if there's some error. So it's a very good way of finding new bugs. Then there's these three things on the bottom. Go thumped, that I, ha I, I guess everybody knows. By the way, it's pronounced GoFumpt. At least the Go team pronounced it GoFumpt. I've heard it so many different ways. I pronounce it GoFumpt. Go FMT sounds OK, I guess. Uh, then there's Go Imports and Go Returns. Uh, so how many of you know GoFumpt? OK, that's everybody. Keep your hand up if you know Go Imports. And keep your hand up if you know Go Returns. Cool. Oh, you know it. <laughs> cool. So GoFumpt. Um, GoFumpt is the one that just formats your code, and the input is uh, valid Go code, and the output is valid Go code that is equivalent, but looks better, basically. And it matches all the uh, formatting, um, formatting guidelines of Go. So uh, how, many, like, 
How many spaces do we use in Go to indent? Anyone? Yeah, we use tabs. There you go. So the good thing is that you don't, ha you don't have to care about those. Uh, those are managed by GoFund. So just forget about it. Everything just happens magically. Now, Go import is similar. But Go import, on top of formatting what it does, it also it fixes a, pro a program. So this, this could be a, your source file. And this is not correct Go code. There's two things missing. One is the package on top. Should it say package main? The second one is that we have thumped that it's not imported. So thumped is not defined. Uh, what Go imports does is it parses this, finds that there's thumb.println, and it tries to find a package named thumped with a function inside named println. And if it finds it, it adds import thumped at the beginning. So basically, when you run Go import from here, you get to all of this automatically. And this should be, at least it is for me, uh, part of your uh, save hook. So every single time you save your file, this should happen. And it's going to allow you to forget about import a package imported but not used, or, oh, you're missing uh, thumped and the fine and so on. You just forget about it, and it just happens automatically for you. It makes your life easier. And if you're a builder, you really care about having your life easier. You have other problems to solve rather than just writing Go. And then the last one is Go returns. And OK, so can, yeah. Uh, so Go returns, it's a really pretty new, I could say, a pretty new tool. And what it does is it actually runs Go thumped and Go imports. And then on top, it does one extra thing, which is when you're returning more than one value in a function, so which happens pretty often, you may be returning an integer and an error, or you could be returning a string, an integer, uh, something, an interface, a pointer to something, and then an error or something, like something really long. Now, when you return, you have to return as many values as you, could, as you said you could return. So in this case, uh, return and nil at the bottom, that's correct. There's two values, and there's two types that I'm returning. But the one in the middle is not correct, return error. Why? Well, because you're missing the integer. But if you don't care about that, what's the value you're going to return? Well, the zero value for the type. And this is what go returns us. So it just adds that zero there. So it makes your life slightly easier. Basically, these tools make you be slightly lazier. <laughs> but the good thing is that if you're a builder, you have all the things to do rather than just taking care of uh, writing code uh, correctly, like writing all the import statements and so on. OK, now I'm going to be talking about what I think is the most important thing at this phase code reviews. And according to Wikipedia, <laughs> a code review, the, the intent of a code review, I actually put things on top of the definition in the, code, in the Wikipedia. But basically, the main uh, idea is to fix mistakes. And I disagree with that, because mistakes should be fixed, should be detected with your tests. So if you have enough tests, normally at this point, you should not have too many errors. So I don't think that code reviews, the most important thing is fixing mistakes. They could fix some mistakes, but it's not the point. Then there's also uniformize, uh, so have uniform code style. And I could argue that this is really important, because when you have the same style all over a code base, if I'm reviewing your code, and I see things like, oh, I, I'm always using i in a for loop. The index is always i. And then you write, index. I'm actually going to be paying more attention to that, the fact that it's slightly different, that different, that the fact that maybe the, the Boolean condition is wrong. So things that the, the, if you're able to write code that doesn't surprise me at all, I will be surprised by the things that are wrong, rather than being surprised by the things that are slightly different but still correct. So having uniform code style is something that I think is really important. And uh, we do it in, I think it's done in pretty much every single open source project. It's, it's done at Go, it's done at Docker, it's definitely done at Kubernetes, so on. And every single project may have a slightly different style, and that's okay. But a, give, a given project should have something pretty uniform. Then the third one is improving the quality of software. And I could argue that the main point of this is that when a software engineer knows that the code is writing it's going to be reviewed. It's going to pay more attention, <laughs> write better code. 
It's not really about the fact that it's going to be reviewed. It's about the fact that you know someone's going to read it. So you're going to try to write code that someone that was not there while the code, while the code was written will, be still, will still be able to understand. So that's, that's something very important. And last but definitely not least, and actually the most important part for me, is that doing code reviews helps improve the quality of developers. So it helps improve the, their skills. And this is because, so I think that the coding culture on a project spreads through code reviews. If you don't have code reviews, your code culture is not going to, it's going to be stuck. Which means that at some point, your code will start being very different in different areas because different developers have different styles. And as I said before, that may be a problem. So coding, the code reviews, for me, it's a teaching opportunity. It's a teaching and learning opportunity, it's a metric. And it's, it, both, it goes both ways. So when you're learning, so when you have your code reviewed, you're gonna learn new things. So one of the things that you're gonna learn is naming conventions, and all the styles, basic styles, but most important thing is you're gonna learn about the code that you're running is maybe not performing enough, you have cubic, and there's a solution that could be faster. And these kind of things, are re I think, are really important to learn and to teach around. If you know a better way of doing it, just teach it. There's also the fact that uh, I'm gonna be telling you about things like, oh, what you, like the, these 100 lines that you just wrote, this uh, reverse proxy, you have that in the standard library. This kind of thing that you might not know. So you're going to discover more things about the standard library. You're going to end up using it better. And the other way around, if I'm reviewing code from someone else, I'm going to keep on learning because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be learning about things like new solutions have to solve a problem. Like some, the fact that someone doesn't have so much experience writing Go doesn't mean that the solutions you will submit won't be the same quality or more than mine. And there's something that I, uh, there's an example of this, which is at GopherCon, t-shirt, uh, last year in Denver, uh, Peter Bergen from Spotify gave a talk and mentioned about a lot of things that they do at Spotify. And one of the things is that at Spotify, when they use flags, they define the flags, they declare the flags inside of the main function. And which is, for me, it was weird because we don't do that in the Go team. And it turns out that they explained that it was like, well, if you do that, the flags cannot be accessed from outside of the main function, so you won't be using, it, using them by mistake somewhere else in the package. And that totally makes sense. So now for me, that's a best practice. So basically, by reviewing code and sharing information, what you're doing is you're increasing the quality of the code in general and increasing the, the skills of all developers, the ones being reviewed and the ones reviewing. So after some time doing all of this, you get to the point where you're a master or a gopher, uh, gopher expert. And gopher experts, as I said before, they understand the spec and they read it. So if you want to be a gopher expert, you should be able to read the spec and understand every single line of it. And I've given talks where I speak 15 minutes about one line of code, uh, one line in the, in the specs. So it's a pretty dense document, but definitely worth reading. They also understand the philosophy. So they understand why Go is done this way and what's the philosophy of simplicity and composition and how to use concurrency. And even better, when not to use concurrency and when not to use interfaces. There's Jeremy Sines gave a talk that was really good about when not to use interfaces uh, at .go. These kind of things are the things that I expect experts to understand and to be able to explain. And the last part is that the recognition. So if you're a gopher expert and you're doing your job correctly, you're sharing your knowledge. You're doing code reviews, you're helping in different projects, you're answering questions in the mailing list, something like that. So you're gonna be able to, so people recognize your name pretty much in, in a good way normally. And something that is gonna be surprising that I say, but at this point, you, you really keep on, on understanding Go as just being a tool. And you try to be a master of that tool. But something that I, I'd like to, to uh, avoid is having people that become masters of a tool and just one single tool. So for me, Go is a great tool, but it's just a tool. 
It's a, it's a good way of solving a problem. And why could you just just a tool? Like Go is great for a lot of a lot of things, but some places it's going to be better to use another language, and that's totally okay. But on top of that, there's a synergy between learn, between languages. So if you're going to be learning, uh, if you write Go and JavaScript. Uh, your JavaScript writing is going to be slightly influenced by the way you write Go. And that has happened to me. I ended up doing, in, Go, in JavaScript, there's no interfaces. But you can fake them pretty much. And I ended up writing code that does composition uh, in JavaScript with Go interfaces in JavaScript. Really weird, but in, it ends up being pretty nice code and it's really easy to read. And I'm sure it's something, it's an idiom that was created by someone else before. But for me, it came from the fact that I was running Go. The other way around is, I'm, as I said at the beginning, I'm a lover of languages. And one of the languages that I've learned is Haskell. And Haskell is awesome and scary at the same time. So many things to learn. And one of the things that you learn is that, well, this is functional programming, right? So there's no mutable state. And you discover that the fact that of not having mutable state in your Go code might make your code easier to understand. There's a place where you have to choose, because if you don't have mutable state, you end up writing code that is totally not idiomatic. And that's not the point. But sometimes, you can check your code and be like, do I really need this field in this struct? Or could it just be a parameter? Because if it can be a parameter, then in all the other methods, I don't have to care about that, uh, about that field at all. It's something that I don't even have to have in my head. And also, if you're doing concurrency, concurrency with immutable state, it's much easier because there's no, there's no data races. But that's, you have to find a compromise between those. And then, wait, so we went through the, all, the four of them. So we went through newcomer, the explorer, the builder, the expert, and now there's this one here. And who is this one? Well, this one is me right now here. <laughs> but and I call it the advocate, but you can call it the speaker. And it's about sharing your knowledge. And so write, uh, write blog posts and talks and complain. Like really, complaining is a way of sharing knowledge. And uh, I really like uh, Peter, was it Peter Borgen? I think it was Peter Borgen. He gave a talk at Fosden uh, some weeks ago about all the things that he didn't like in Go and things that he, he wanted to have. And that feedback is awesome for the community. It, it actually makes the community evolve. And so uh, if you want to share your knowledge, uh, there's, there's things like this conference, which is awesome, like all the speakers coming here. That's awesome. It's people that know what they're doing, telling us about how they do it, and that's great. Other than conferences, there's also Go meetups. And so I wrote this, this web page that just gets all the information from meetup.com and shows all the Go meetups. And I filter by Asia, and the biggest Go meetup ever in Asia is actually Bangalore with 375 members. So congratulations, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> and to end, I would like to uh, mention that when you're an advocate, you don't need to be, you don't need to have a lot of experience. If you have a lot of experience that you're an advocate, you're going to be teaching people about how to do things. And that's great. That's awesome. But at the same time, and that's the top down of, uh, I know what I'm doing, and I'm going to tell you the way I do it. And then you might learn something out of it.